from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Using physical punishment to discipline students is still legal in many public and private schools in the United States. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that corporal punishment in all school settings be abolished by law. It's a fairly small proportion of schools overall that use corporal punishment. But from the perspective of the policy statement and the AAP, you know, the number should be zero. Plus, new research shows an alarming statistic about ADHD medication errors. I think when you pick up the paper, the one that's going to jump out at you the most is the 299% increase in exposures over the study period. These stories and more on Pediatrics on Call, the podcast on children's health from the AAP. I'm Dr. Joanna parga Malinky, And I'm Dr. David Hill. This podcast is for everyone in the medical community, keeping our children healthy and safe. It's a show by pediatricians for pediatricians. But anyone who cares about kids will get a lot out of it as well. Let's start today's episode with a conversation about ending corporal punishment in schools. Joanna, I think I know the answer, but I'm going to ask you anyway. Were you ever paddled in school like as a punishment? Oh my gosh, no. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I guessed, and I am so glad. Attending the Memphis public schools in the 1970s and 80s, a ruler to the palm was nothing. A paddle to the bottom was the ultimate threat, and I experienced both at least once. I'm sorry, David. I don't even know what to say. I'm sort of horrified. I did not experience that in public schools in New York in the 1990s. And that is good news. In retrospect... I am kind of horrified as well, but at the time, it's just, you know, what was done. What's remarkable is that some schools are still using those punishments to this day, and the AAP has some thoughts. And we have just the person to share those thoughts, Dr. Mandy Allison, an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Colorado. She is first author on a new policy statement, Corporal Punishment in Schools. Mandy, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I have to admit, when I saw this policy statement, I thought, wait, are people still doing this? Can you tell us about what corporal punishment schools use in the U.S. today? Sure. The most typical kind of corporal punishment is known as paddling, so where a flat, hard object is struck against someone's typically like thighs or bottom. But corporal punishment can be any type of physical punishment used on students with the goal of managing behaviors in school. And is this a common thing? Where do you find data on this? Yeah. So the U.S. Department of Education and the Office of Civil Rights actually does a survey looking at many aspects of education. But one of those is use of different types of kind of punishments or consequences in school. So that's where you'll find data on suspensions and expulsions, as well as the use of corporal punishment. So at present, corporal punishment is legal in public schools in 17 states, and there is a table of of the states where it's legal in the policy statement. And then it's also legal in private schools in all states except Iowa and New Jersey. And the question about is it common is interesting because it's a fairly small proportion of schools overall that use corporal punishment. But from the perspective of the policy statement and the AAP, you know, the number should be zero. So so anything above zero is too much, probably, from the AAP's perspective. Dr. Allison, I know when I was in school, we were all scared of being sent to be paddled, but people still misbehaved. How does corporal punishment actually affect children's behavior? Good question. So this is a tricky thing to study, right? Because you you can't do a study where you say randomize some people or some schools to use corporal punishment and some not. A lot of the data that we have actually comes from 
studies of disciplinary practices used in home-based settings. And as you all know, the AAP has a separate policy statement all about that. But some of the data that we used are, are from that policy statement. There have been some studies also that are kind of natural experiments, so kind of association type studies that have been conducted in school settings. And so what we know is that striking a child may, in the short term, curb a behavior that you don't want to see. But what we also know is that that's not typically a successful long-term solution, right? And again, that's based from kind of individual dyadic parent-child interactions, as well as some of the things that we've seen from these association studies in schools. You mentioned the long term. Are there long term harms that children suffer from corporal punishment in schools? It appears that there are. Again, you know, the data are somewhat limited, but from what we do have across many countries, which I think strengthens the overall picture we get from that, you definitely see some long term consequences that are both behavioral and academic. So in one study, they saw differences among children who reported being paddled and those who didn't in terms of math scores on academic tests. In other studies, you know, they've looked at is the school climate or the behavior in general better in that school that uses corporal punishment or not? And the answer is it's not better. And in some cases, it's actually worse in some of those measures. So it doesn't fix the setting in the, the school. And then students also have reported, like in a, studies of adults who like David, recollect being paddled, you know, on an individual level, they report some negative symptoms from that. So who's more likely to receive this sort of punishment? Are we looking at an equity issue here? Yeah, and I think that that's the most important reason for why we refreshed and and republished this policy statement, because there was a policy statement written by the AAP about 20 years ago that was retired. And then we refreshed this partly because of the equity issues. And again, those data really come from the U.S. Department of Education Office of Civil Rights survey. And we know that Black boys are much more likely to be paddled than anyone else. And that if you compare white identifying girls and Black identifying girls, that Black girls are more likely to be punished. And then also students with disabilities, and and disabilities in this case is defined as students who have an IEP or individualized education plan, those students are more likely to be struck at school or have corporal punishment used on them. And so I think Again, the number ideally would be zero of children who are struck at school because it's not an effective disciplinary method and there are effective methods that can be used. But I think on top of that, the real concern is that these disciplinary methods are not being administered equally. Well, you mentioned that there are other techniques that work better to help children learn appropriate behaviors in school. Can we go through what some of those are? Yeah, and I'll just start with kind of reiterating. So I actually was a school teacher before I went to medical school in the short term, but you know, I am not an education expert, right? So the very first thing I want to say is pediatric practitioners definitely should have a good understanding of what goes on in schools, but also remember that we are not the experts, right? That the people who spend their careers rather than just a few years teaching like me in the education fields are the ones who are really the experts. So I will share some of that, but keep in mind that if as a pediatric provider, you're really interested in this, go to the education experts. Don't really listen to me. But there are lots of kind of, and we talk about this briefly with some resources in the policy statement, but there are other things that are known to work. So one of those is known as PBIS or positive behavioral interventions and supports. And basically it's 
ideally what you're going to do is reinforce the behavior that you want to see. And as pediatricians, you're super familiar with this, right? Because this is what we teach families on an individual level in practice, that the most effective way to, to see a behavior in a child is to do positive reinforcement. So it's that same idea, but at a school level, right? And there's kind of different tiers of how you can implement that. Other kind of concepts that are really critical in the school setting are surrounding just being trauma-informed. So there's a lot of work surrounding creating trauma-informed schools, right? So where you're understanding kind of, well, what are the underlying causes of these behavioral disruptions? And how can we understand that student and, and why they might be behaving this way? And can we get at those root causes rather than just focusing on, you know, you acted out, you swore in class, you hit another kid, like, why is that happening? And what can we do to address the root causes? And, you know, that's hard, right? Because that means improving mental health services in schools and things like that. But at the end of the day, what we know is when those support systems are in place, you see a better school climate and a reduction in the need for kind of more negative disciplinary actions and an improvement in the overall behaviors of children in the school. So if I'm seeing a family for a wellness exam or something and they say that the child or the child says that they've been paddled in school, what's the best way for me to react as a care provider? That's a great question and a tricky one. Thanks for that. Um, I think a couple thoughts. One is I might start with exploring why the child is getting like the behaviors the child is doing that's causing them to then have the disciplinary action of being paddled. Not to suss out, like, do they deserve it or not? But again, trying to understand, you know, what's going on in school, right? Are there things I can do as a pediatrician to support this child to get at the root cause of those behaviors? So that would be the perspective with delving more into like, well, tell me a little bit more about, you know, what's happening at school before you get paddled. Why are you getting sent to get paddled? And then trying to see if there's ways that you can intervene on those behaviors in a positive way. And then I think the other side is, you know, talking to the family a little bit about their perspectives on paddling. And, and the reason I bring that up is because, you know, there are families where culturally the paddling at school is feels like an appropriate method of discipline to them. And so I think on an individual level, kind of regardless of how the AAP feels about it or how you feel about it as a pediatrician, a community member, a parent, you know, understanding the parent and the kid's perspective might be helpful. And then it's almost pulling out some of those motivational interviewing skills, like where you kind of understand the parents and the child's perspective on the paddling and then say, can I share some of the things I know about paddling with you? And then you could share, you know, there isn't good evidence that it's effective. What might we consider that would be more effective? And then you could offer to the family, in particular, if they, you know, feel that they really don't want their child paddled you could offer to then intervene at the school level. But I would want to do that with the family's knowledge and and kind of permission or support in reaching out. And taking this topic outside the clinic walls, now that we have this new policy statement, what can we as pediatricians and advocates do to help ensure that no more school children undergo this type of punishment? Yeah, so I think it really is advocacy for a pediatric provider. And I think that that could be at the local level, state level, or national level. And I'll give examples, you know, of what that might look like at all three levels. So at the local level, so one, among the states where corporal punishment is still allowed or legal, not every school uses it, right? And so you could find out 
from that data source I keep citing, (laughs) the Office of Civil Rights, whether your particular district, and you could reach out to your particular school to find out whether corporal punishment is being used and then do some advocacy at that more local level. The other thing you can do is if you happen to be in one of the states where corporal punishment is legalized, you can reach out to your legislators at the state level to advocate to ban corporal punishment. It just happened in my state in Colorado, in fact. And then finally, at the national level, there have been efforts in the past to create a federal law banning corporal punishment. So you could also reach out to your national level legislators to talk to them about supporting that kind of bill. And Mandy, we could keep you here all day, but do you have any last takeaways for our listeners about effective behavior modifications that work in schools? I mean, I think, again, really focusing on promoting the behaviors you want to see is one key factor. Two, a focus on a kind of school-level climate intervention. So you make school a safe and supportive place for all kids. And then finally, like the truth is, yes, there are going to be kids that act out and they need consequences, right? But being mindful that those consequences are also kind of getting at the root cause. So there's another concept called restorative justice. That's another way, right, of trying to kind of understand the behavior that happened, the negative thing that happened, support healing for the person who was harmed, and then also try to help the person who caused the harm understand why that was harmful, right? And and so get at, try to kind of develop their sense of understanding about why they shouldn't do that behavior. And so, yes, schools are going to need to have negative consequences. There are circumstances where kids are not safe to come to school. So I'm not saying that should all end, but just that it needs to be done in this bigger picture setting of understanding the root causes of what's driving that behavior on an individual level and in a school setting and kind of neighborhood systemic level. And again, the policy state, because I am not the expert (laughs) on school level and individual level interventions at a school site, the policy statement has some additional resources. And that's something, though, where pediatric providers could partner, right, with their school systems to help promote some of those alternative methods of promoting the behavior we want to see in school and reducing the negative behaviors. Dr. Mandy Allison, thank you so much for joining us today. Again, thank you for letting me talk about something I care about. To read the policy statement, Corporal Punishment in Schools, go to aap.org slash podcast. Coming up, we'll look at the rise in ADHD medication errors between the years 2000 and 2021. Joanna, you know that I prescribe medications for ADHD, but I don't think you know I've also administered them as a parent. I do remember you mentioning that to me. What was it like giving those medications to your own children? You know, at times confusing. We never really did find the right medication for my child with ADHD. But in the meantime, we were juggling different doses and different times like so many parents. And we weren't even dealing with two or three different medications, which many families are. Oh, I'm just imagining that situation. And to me, it seems like a medication error waiting to happen. Do we know how common those are for ADHD meds? I don't, but our next guest, Natalie Ryan, does. She is an author on a new paper in pediatrics, Pediatric ADHD Medication Errors Reported to the United States Poison Centers, 2000-2021. She's also the director of the Central Ohio Poison Center at Nationwide Children's Hospital. Natalie, welcome to the show. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me. Okay, as both a parent and a practitioner, I feel like ADHD is increasingly common. How many children are taking medications for this condition? 
One of the studies back in 2019, about 3.3 million children, or about five out of every 100 children, are prescribed a medication for ADHD in the U.S. So pretty big number. And the paper includes information on ADHD medication errors and calls to poison control centers. During the time period you studied, how many of these calls occurred? So from the study period we looked at, about 20-something years, there are about 87,000, a little over 87,000 medication errors that were reported to poison control centers. Wow. And how dangerous can these medications be if they're not properly dosed or consumed? What sorts of reactions did you guys see? Um, That depends on the ADHD medications. By and large, the amphetamines are the most common. Whenever a child gets too much of a dose of a stimulant, the big side effects that you can see typically are tremors, agitation, they're anxious, sometimes they'll get a headache or have higher blood pressure. But typically, you know, they're kind of short lived, and you can just monitor them at home. So not too concerning. One of the other types of medications that we use is guanfacine. Clonidine is another one. And those are can be used for blood pressure management, actually, just but they have shown benefit in this population. So that side effect profile uh, is going to be a little bit different than your agitation, anxious, you know, tremor kind of side effects. These can be a little bit more sedating, which kind of seems uh, surprising, but you can have a drop in blood pressure eventually. But those are kids because they're longer acting that we're going to watch for a little bit longer and they tend to have the more serious side effects compared to the stimulants. The great news is about most of these medications, about 83% of these cases were managed at home. And again, these are most likely going to be the stimulants that I mentioned, just because usually if it's one extra dose and the child's used to taking it, obviously there's a lot of ifs and about each individual case, but we typically see that these kids can stay at home. Uh, I think it's about 2% that actually ended up going to the hospital and Those are typically related to some of those other medications, the clonidines, the guanfacines that are a little bit more serious that we have to keep a closer eye on. And did you see any patterns in who ended up presenting for care when medication errors or overdoses occurred? What sorts of kids seem to be at highest risk? The age group that we saw most commonly was the 6 to 12-year-old age group. They accounted for almost two-thirds of the exposures, the errors that were reported to us. And then about three quarters of those were male. You know, knowing that these medication errors are occurring and that more people are taking medication for ADHD, what are some ways we can prevent these errors? I think that that's a fantastic question. And one of the big things that I hope that the article highlights is that, like you said, these are preventable errors. And, you know, you alluded to, you know, being a parent and a practitioner yourself. It's hard to keep track if you think about yourself did I take that medication supplement this morning? Hmm, I don't remember. And then if you're trying to take care of yourself, you're trying to take care of a child as well, you know, and you have a medication that's dosed likely more than once a day, I think the best thing you can do is just have a good tracking system for medication administration. So something as simple as keeping, you know, a piece of paper in a common area where you, another parent, both parents can see if a dose was administered or not, is going to be one of the biggest things you can do. Because the most common type of error we saw is that the patient got an extra dose. And so a lot of that is you're rustling around in the morning, things are busy, can't remember if a dose was given or not, or it's the other parent gives another dose because they didn't think the other parent did. So it's just having a good communication tracking system. And you're a pharmacist by training as well. You see a lot of different medications and their packaging and kind of what they look like. Are these packaged in a way that it would make it easy to track how many doses you've taken or are they just coming in bottles with a bunch of pills? Typically, I would say that these are probably just, you know, your traditional pill bottles that you pick up from the pharmacy. And that's one other thing that you could do too is there are some places that will do blister packs for you and you can have them package morning meds and afternoon meds to the point that some will even put dates and times on them, I think. You could also do, there's a lot of different apps that are out there too that you could keep track. And I'm sure there's a way to have, you know, another user in so that anyone that's administering medication to the child can help keep track. Because you have to take into account kiddos that will get a dose in the morning at home, then go to school and maybe the school nurse needs to administer a dose. So making sure to utilize something like that for everyone to be on the same page is probably wise. 
This is a really ambitious study. It covered 21 years of medication errors. Were there any trends that jumped out at you from these data? I think when you pick up the paper, the one that's going to jump out at you the most is the 299% increase in exposures over the study period. So that is really, really big. But we've also seen an increased diagnosis of ADHD in children. And with that, it's likely that there are more prescriptions for ADHD medications. But I don't know that that's a direct cause. And the other thing, too, is that this hasn't been a direct straight line. It hasn't just been, you know, from 2000, just everything has shot up continuously. That line has kind of come up and come down over the years, depending on different trends with uh, different medications coming in and out of favor. And for all the general pediatricians listening, because I think they might get some of these calls to their office as well, when you're at the Poison Control Center and someone calls in and says that their child is overdosed on an ADHD medication, what are you asking and what kind of counseling are you giving that family over the phone? Uh, One of the first things we try to do is, especially if this is a parent, you know, we'll make sure to say, hey, we're more than happy to help you with that. Let's just quickly talk through what happened. So we'll review how old is the child, how much does the child weigh, and then we'll ask for the specific medication so we know what we're dealing with. And then we'll go through, you know, how long ago did this happen? How much of an overdose did the child get? Is this an extra dose? Did it happen back to back? Did someone get one this morning and then got another dose three or four hours later? So we'll walk them through all of those sorts of things. And depending on what the dose of the medication is, we can help them decide, is this someone we can watch them for another hour or two, then give them a call back, see how they're doing? Or is this someone that got way too much of a dose? You know, say it's a younger sibling that got into the older sibling's medication and you know they are very symptomatic, then we'll refer them in. Just kind of depends on how the patient looks and the symptoms that they describe to us. All right, Natalie, this has been fascinating. Do you have any last takeaways for our listeners? I think the big thing is just to be aware of the errors. Like these are things that happen to everybody. So there's no shame in parents having this happen. And if anything, if you ever come across a question with dosing a medication or side effects, whether it's an ADHD medication or any others, you're always welcome to call the Poison Center, 1-800-222-1222. We have pharmacists and nurses that are available. They're specially trained. We're there 24-7, 365. We're always happy to help you with whatever questions you have. Natalie Ryan, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It was a joy to talk to you both. To read the article, Pediatric ADHD Medication Errors Reported to United States Poison Centers 2000 to 2021, join us at aap.org slash podcast. At the end of every episode, we like to leave you with something positive or enlightening. We call this segment Say Ah. Uh, David, what's your Say Ah uh, this week? I'm really saying, ah, after weeks of temperatures in the high 80s and mid 90s, it is cooling off here in coastal Wilmington, North Carolina. The ibis are flying overhead. The geese are flying overhead. There was a green heron, which is a fairly rare sighting in the lake. They're going past right now. And I am just loving walking the dogs along the lakeside and seeing everything changing and being able to breathe without, I don't know, sweating through my shirt for a change. That sounds so nice. It's getting very fall here too in Philadelphia. Um, But my say ah has to do with home cooking. Uh, Danny actually had to go away for a film shoot for a few days and my parents came And it was really great. They helped me take care of the kids, but most importantly, my mother kept me fed. And there's just something so nice about having home cooking from your mother that you remember as a child, you know, the familiarity and the comfort there. So thanks to my mom for getting me through a few days of solo parenting, but with support. I think that's a say. Mm. That's it for today's episode. If you like Pediatrics on Call, please subscribe on your favorite podcast app and help us spread the word. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Pediatrics on Call. Pediatrics on Call is a production of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Our producer and editor is Ann Johnsos. Our audio engineer is Doug Nagel. Joe Puskars is our associate producer and Susan Martin is our executive producer. Our theme music was composed by Matthew Simonson. Join us next week when we'll have the October edition of First Up. 
with the one and only Lewis First. We'll also talk to Dr. Sherry Zorn about her efforts to change the framework for the HPV vaccine. I'm Dr. David Hill. And I'm Dr. Joanna Pargavalinki. Thanks for listening.